It's exciting to be back, but it is especially exciting to be back on Anniversary Sunday. And there is something about celebrating an anniversary that allows you to do a couple of things. It allows your memory to recall some of the great moments that we have spent in this building. Not the significance of the building, but the significance of the people here and the things that have gone on here as we worship the Lord and as we serve Him in this place. But it also allows us an opportunity to, to reflect and to make sure that we correctly define our course. Sometimes we look and we realize there are things we need to do better. Sometimes we look and we realize there are things that may be missing. Uh, specifically on my mind over this month is the idea of correct doctrine. Of making sure that the things that we teach, but also the things that we live as a church family are such that they are correct according to God's Word and that they honor Him in every possible way. And so I've given this sermon series the title, Blueprint, God's Plan for the Church. We all know what a blueprint is, right? You lay out a blueprint and it has the, the basic design, the core design of what something should look like upon completion. And so that's what we think about in the church. We want to think about that we are following God's design and Christ's design for what the church can be and should be. Now, I'm reminded of a little girl. When this girl was born, her grandmother wanted to give her a special gift. And so she presented her granddaughter her very first Bible. And, you know, we, we have the different Bibles that we give, whether it's the small ones. In this case, it was a, a larger, it was a storybook Bible, but it had the, the Bible stories written in a way that could be easy for a child to understand as she grew up. The grandmother was so excited to be able to do that for her granddaughter. As that granddaughter grew, so did the grandmother advanced in age, and there came a point where the grandmother realized her health was failing. The granddaughter, by the way, was the only grandchild. And so she wanted to present her granddaughter with the family Bible. Now, if you grew up in a family like mine, you know what the family Bible is. It's the one that it takes two hands to pick up and, and to sit down, and it has very large pages. And, but there's something unique about that family Bible, isn't it? You open it up and it has these sections at the beginning that allows you to write down the birth of family members, but also records their passing. And so as this little girl had grown up, and she was still young, but she was, uh, she was old enough to appreciate what her grandmother was giving her. She was really in awe of this. And so they, they sat down, and by the way, you know, if it's an old family Bible, it's written in the honored, the time-honored King James Version. And so there she was, and the granddaughter's looking through it, and, and she's noticing, she's having to gra ask her grandmother about some of the words, how to pronounce those, and what they mean, and they're doing all of that. And she's looking at family members, ones that she never had opportunity to meet. She's asking questions about them. It's a great time of these stories that are being asked. The granddaughter, though, begins to ask some Bible questions, and, and, and the grandmother's impressed by that, and she's answering those. And then there was the one question that just stumped the grandmother. It's when the granddaughter asked, uh, Grandmother, what is it? Who was it that was, was Jesus' mother? Was it the Virgin Mary or the King James Virgin? Children. It was, it was innocent. She didn't know. And she didn't understand. Well, we, we live in a day and age where I, I'm going to suggest to you that in our culture, and, and I fear even at times in the church, that we've lost our way. But when we say that we've lost our way, sometimes it is intentional. It is a, an intentional decision to go down a path of sin. But other times, on the other end, can be just as, as simple as the, the grandchild that asks a question. And, and that, that question was asked really out of 
out of not knowing. Not understanding, and we might even use the term of just innocence or ignorance. She didn't know. Church, we live in a day and time where our culture, we have a path of some that are choosing a direct path of sin, but others that are choosing that same path, but they're not doing so out of an evil intention. It's out of ignorance and a lack of understanding. How many of you kept up with the news over the last 24 hours? Man, it has been a horrific 24 hours in our country as we have watched on two separate occasions of when men pulled out guns and just had no thought, no consciousness for life. Church, that's evil. But do you know what scares me more? There is something that scares me more than the fact that two men pulled out guns and fired them in rapid succession, taking loss of life and hurting others with absolutely no thought in their mind. But the thing that bothers me more about that is the response of people around our country. We've got politicians that they pull out phrases like, they're in our thoughts and prayers. It's like political rhetoric. And forgive me, and I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that I'm wrong, but we should never use a statement like, I'm praying for you. It's political rhetoric. Shame on us. We can't do that. But we also, we've got a group of people that'll just say, where's God? Talk about church, church. Why bother with church? And we have people that don't... You know, how many of you remember after 9-11? Do you remember church buildings being full? Of where people came together... And I'm going to remind you, that wasn't but 18 years ago. I'm telling you, that does not happen today. That does not happen today. We don't come together for prayer meetings anymore because our society has declared, God, why bother? And I've got a pretty good reason, or at least one major reason of why that is happening. Because in the church, we are saying, we may not realize it, it but it is loud and it is clear to society. But even in the church at times, we are declaring, church, why bother? Do you know that still, according to Barna Research, 73% of Americans describe themselves as Christians. 73%. But out of that group, only 35% will be in worship on a regular basis Sunday after Sunday. Now, we may offer whatever excuse we want, but you know what statement that makes to the world? Is that even as Christians, we're saying, church, why bother? Well, church, worship is optional. The idea of being together, is God, it's just optional. Can I read you a verse of Scripture? It's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. This is a powerful statement from Paul. Paul writes, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Church, the church is the body of Christ. The church is the body of... By the way, did you notice the verb language? Students, you're getting ready to go back to school. You need a good refresher course on these things. The church is his body who fills everything in every... Church, that is written in a present tense. It is written in an active tense. The things that Paul wrote, they were just as true as the day he wrote them as they are, they're true today, and they will be true on the day when our young ones grow up and you have opportunity to be parents and grandparents. Jesus is the head of the church and we are his body that is present it is active and it should describe who we are today Jesus continues to fill everything in every way and to the point that we don't understand that church we have a problem we must come to a correct teaching a correct understanding of that biblical statement so let's clear up the fallacy 
I like the new roof on our building. I like the way it looks from the road. I like the fact that, that we really try to offer a lot of things here, but the church is not a building. The church is not a building. In fact, I've got this statement on your outline. It was so good, I wanted to make sure you had it and you could take it with you. The church is ordinary people. The building just keeps the weather out. I like that. All right, let's get down. I need you to have your Bibles open. We've got a lot of passages to cover, just a little bit of time, and then a very strong point at the end. We want to look at this plan for the church. We want to begin in Matthew chapter 16 because it's there in chapter 16, beginning in verse 13 where Jesus asked two questions. He said, what do other people say that I am? But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. If Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by my flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you were Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Church, it is that one statement that Peter declared, You are the Messiah, you are the Christ, you are the Son of God. That is a statement that changed the world. We started at times talking about how to make an impact in the world, and I've got to tell you, Peter made that impact. The disciples, the apostles made that impact with one statement. Jesus is the Son of God. Acts chapter 2, verse 36, what was it Peter declared? He's standing up at the day of Pentecost, and he's preaching a sermon of sermons. And what was it that he had to say? Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That's Acts 2, 36. 2, 37, what happened? It says that the people were cut to the heart. They were pierced to the heart. And they said, what do we do? Acts 2, 38, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We know that Peter continued to plead with them and the people responded. Scripture tells us in Acts 2, 41 that those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. But keep following me, will you? It said we're in Acts, still in chapter 2, verse 47. Scripture says, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Flip over to Acts chapter 4, verse 4, where Scripture tells us, But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Acts chapter 6, verse 7 continues. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Even after Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7, the, the disciples and all these, the followers of Jesus scattered. Acts chapter 8 verse 4 says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Friends, the church grew. The church grew and it began with one statement. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. That message changed the world. And it stands to change the world today. But before we will ever convince a world of that truth, we have to make sure that we are being guided, we are being led, and that truth absorbs every ounce of our being. That Jesus is filling us everything in every way. Now the part that we missed as we went through those verses very quickly is that there was persecution every step of the way. Whether it was Peter and John being called in, whether it was Stephen being stoned, the church faced persecution from the outside. But then an interesting thing happens as we continue to follow the course of the church. Where Satan was not effective at attacking the church with persecution from the outside, he sought to destroy the church from the inside with false teaching. Let's go to our reading for today that Freddie read earlier. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. A critical statement to the young preacher. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing in His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. Verse 5. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Friends, there have been in various points along the path where, in, in Scripture of where we see that there was a crossroads. It's like what took place in John chapter 6. You remember that? Jesus fed the 5,000. They came back the next day, and Jesus had this tremendous, this powerful, even the disciples described it as a hard teaching. And Scripture tells us at the end of John chapter 6 that at that point, many of Jesus' own disciples turned away and no longer followed him. They reached that intersection and many of Jesus' disciples decided that the teaching was simply too hard. But Jesus turned. He turned to the twelve and he asked them, what about you? Do you want to leave too? Again, it was Peter that spoke up. What did he say? Where else can we go? Because you, you have the words of life. He said, Jesus, you are the Holy One of God. And, and you see, we reach various points in life, and I find it interesting of how uh, Paul is describing this to Timothy, of how this happens, that there comes a point because of the impact of culture around us, that even in the church today, we decide that this teaching is too hard. Now, we've got a statement that we use today because it sounds a little softer. We'll say that the teaching sounds outdated. Can I tell you something, church? Remember that in Ephesians chapter 1? That was written in present tense, in active tense. The truth was truth the day that it was penned. The truth was truth in the first century church, and in the second century, and in the third century church. It remains truth today. Time does not change the truth. We must make sure that as we read Scripture... Now, there's a key thought for us, but more about that tonight. We must read Scripture. We must study Scripture to make sure that we're living the truth. Because if we're not careful... You, you see, I'm convinced today that in a lot of churches some, some false things are being taught. Sometimes it is because you've got preachers that want to keep their job, and so they want to say things that they know will fall on good ears in the congregation, and so they're... They're preaching what the itching ears want to hear. Sometimes you've got good-meaning teachers. You've got good-meaning uh, leaders in the family that, that we, we, we really do mean well, but we've not read and we've not studied correctly. We've seen examples of that even in Scripture, of where these things must be, must be explained more correctly. And sometimes it really is just the fact that you've got a good heart and, and you just miss the point. But you see, ignorance is no excuse. Now when I look around at the crowd of many of us who have grown up with a Bible in our hands, we have grown up with a Bible accessible to us. We must be willing to read, to study, to live, and to teach that truth. We preach it when it's easy, and we preach it when it's not. We preach it when people nod their head yes, and we preach it when they pick up stones and want to throw them at us. Because the truth is the truth. It always has been, it always is, and it always will be. Amen. 
So we cannot turn away from the truth. So what do we do as we find ourselves at this intersection, at this moment that we look and we give thanks to God for 54 great years in this place? Can I give you just a couple of passages as we get ready to leave? We begin in Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Romans 16, verse 17, Paul said, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who will cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Then to 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, that tells me a couple of things we need to make sure that we have right before we go. Because Paul talks about the things that you have learned. We've got to make sure, church, that even as we think about things that our elders have taught us, that people of the generations before have taught us, it is good, it is appropriate for us to always re-examine those things. I don't want to follow error just because the generation before me followed error. But I also want to make it such that the generation after me doesn't follow error because we did. We have an obligation to always study to make sure we are seeking out the truth of Scripture, that we are looking at God's blueprint and His plan for the church and His plan for us. And so what was Paul's message? Did you find the word? I, I, I bolded it in my text to make sure that I had that. The word found in Romans 16 and also in 1 Timothy, the word watch. The word watch. It is imperative, church, that we constantly watch. And, and so that's a reason that it's important for us to, to be together. And I was reading an article recently that talked about the importance of us being together as a church family for worship and study. And I love this that I, that I read. One of the things it talked about was simply the importance of being reminded. Do you know why it's important for us to be together the first day of each week? To take of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the fruit of the vine. What was it Jesus said? Do this in remembrance of me. We come together and we take that each week so that we will remember. Many of these scriptures that we've looked at today, these are old scriptures, these are familiar scriptures to us, but why is it important that we hear them again? So that we can be reminded of who we need to be. So that we will know the truth, that we are so familiar with the truth, that we recognize sin, we recognize temptation, and we recognize false teaching any time that it presents itself before us. How do we make sure we do that? Paul used the word watch. And I love this statement. Guys, you'll appreciate this. If you've ever had something new, you started trying to put it together and it didn't work, if all else fails, read the instructions. Church, if all else fails, read the instructions. We go back to the word of God. Can I tell you this? Can I remind you of this as we close? That it is important that we do this because we will not just stand still. As a church family, we will either grow or we will shrink. Some of you have heard it's called the second, uh, the second law of thermodynamics. It suggests that things are always moving in a state of degeneration and disorder. Simply, everything, if left alone, will decay. If you leave a house, go around town, find any house that has been left alone, and what happens to it? It becomes in a state of decay. If we take our Christian walk with the Lord and we don't constantly nourish it, constantly keep it fresh, constantly making sure we're staying the truth, what happens? We will, we will lose what we've got. We will degenerate. We will slip. We will drift away. And so we want to make sure that we are constantly responding, constantly living to that truth.
that we find in Scripture, but it begins with one statement, that Jesus is the Son of God. That was the statement that the group at Pentecost responded to. It's the, the statement that over the years, people, people, countless people have responded that Jesus is the Son of God and been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. It's the same invitation that's offered even this very hour. That if you're not a Christian, may you make that good statement. Jesus is the Son of God. Of God. For the others of us, we have this opportunity to ask ourselves, are we constantly staying in touch and following the blueprint that God has provided for us? If we can help you this morning, we want to invite them to, to respond to that opportunity even now. Just come to the front as we stand and as we sing.